Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the basis for today's sermon is the gospel lesson that we just heard, that of the shrewd steward or the villain or both. Is he a hero in the story? Well, we'll see. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, uh, yesterday at the VBS uh, Family Day, uh, we talked all about Jesus and Him teaching parables. And we did so for about, I don't know, an hour and change. And that was really the introduction uh, to this parable here. So I'm going to run through all of that and take about an hour, hour and change to get through that, and then we'll do the, the, today's sermon. Is that, is that fair? No? Okay. All right. I didn't think so. You know, the problem interpreting this parable is that Jesus praises a man who's a scoundrel, encouraging us, even calling us children of light, encouraging the children of light to be just like him. So what in the world is going on? Well, by way of review, a rich man has a manager. It is a steward who saw to all the rich man's affairs. He looked after his property. He paid all of the bills. He kept the budget. He invested his money. He hired and supervised all of the employees. The steward had enormous power. Everything that he did, everything he said, was binding. You could think of him as Joseph of old in your Old Testament who managed all of Egypt second only to Pharaoh. But then some nameless informant. You got to watch those nameless informants. Convinces the rich man to sack the steward and sure enough in walks the rich man with the pink slip in hand. This is your termination notice. Put my affairs in order and vacate the premises. No thank you for your years of service, no parting gift, no party, no plaque, no gold watch, nothing. Just leave. Boy, the steward did not see this coming. And he knows, according to verse 3, that he's got bad relationships with everyone in town. There is no way that he will ever land another job, not like this one. Posting his resume online will get him nowhere. It won't help. He'll be reduced to begging or reduced to manual labor. And boy, with his soft hands and his bad back, he won't survive. And so his plan is to inform his master's debtors that he's not enormous amounts off of what they owe. Actually, what he's done is take out his fees. The thought is, which I think is helpful, is that this steward built into these debts an enormous cut for himself, which allows him to write off one bill by half and another bill by a fifth. Now, obviously, the debtors are elated and what's the steward done? He has created friendships that he didn't have before. Friendships which will hopefully allow him to then land on his feet once he's then escorted out of the master's house. He is now seen as being gracious in the eyes of the debtors. Now what baits our noodle is verse 8 where the rich man comes in he sees what the steward has done. He sees the bottom line, and he commends him. The rich man is actually impressed for the steward gave up short-term financial gains and put his money into something that in the long term was more valuable, namely making relationships. Our Lord's point in verses 8 and 9 is, Here's a man inside of a secular framework. It is one who pays no attention to the kingdom of God, no attention to life everlasting, and he's wiser with the use of his wealth than the children of light are with their wealth. That's the first point 
that Jesus makes. The sons of this world, the world, as you know, is passing away. So the sons of this world are more shrewd than the sons of light. In other words, look at how clever this steward is in securing his future. Why is it then that you are not as zealous about your eternal future? All right. So there's two things for us to consider. I'll be brief this morning, but they are, they are hard-hitting. And also, please keep in mind that I have lived with this text all week long. You're going to get it in like 12 minutes or less. First, you are a steward. Just like the guy in our lesson. You are a steward of money, hear me, that is not yours. Whoa, well, whose money do I manage? Well, I'm glad you asked. You manage God's money. Well, I never. I know, I know you think it's all yours. I do too. This is one of my biggest struggles. But it's not ours. And we need to repent. We forget that we're the steward and not the master. Our money is all God's. All? Did he just say all? But I made it with my own two hands. You mean the two hands that God gave you? It was my skill. Oh, you mean the skill that God gave you? Along with the health, along with the strength, along with the breath, it's all God's. What you have has been given to you as a gift for you to use as the Lord sees fit. Listen, listen to David. These are not my words. Listen to David, a very wealthy man who prayed in 1 Chronicles 29. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. For all things, David says, comes from you. Gang, you are a steward of money that is not yours. And what Jesus is calling us to do is to live from a different perspective, that being the perspective of generosity. Again, inside a secular framework where one, no one, or where, where one does not have the thought or even the, the idea or the desire to understand the kingdom of God or eternal life at all, people, though, intrinsically know to put their money in something that will increase in value. But what do we believe as children of light? That there is nothing that is going to last. There's nothing in this world. There's no material thing, no asset, no place you can put your money that it will really ask. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount many a time. So invest your money in the things that will last forever. And regarding what lasts forever, Jesus actually describes heaven. When discussing heaven, we're used to hearing about glory and crowns and harps and streets of gold. But folks, none of that really moves me. And I assume it really doesn't move you very much either. None of that moves me then to be generous. How does Jesus describe heaven? Friends, Jesus says that heaven is a place of friends who are having a party, a big party. It is a place of love and belonging. And it's what we all want to be a part of. For in this life, many times love is a source of pain more so than a source of joy because from time to time, friends, well, they sin against each other. Whether or not on purpose, they will do so. It's just what sinners do. Friends, use one another. There's pride among friends. There's jealousy among friends. There's pettiness and moodiness among friends. Even death. Death is the great separator of friends. 
separating the closest of friends, but not in heaven, not there. None of those things exist in heaven. So what is our Lord doing? He's explaining a love that is not here. It's there. So what does He say to do in the meantime? He says, be like the steward in the parable who realizes it's more important to have friends in the future than money in the bank right now. Be like the steward who gives up what he's ultimately going to lose to gain that which he will never lose, that being friends, surviving beyond death, who will welcome you into eternal friends. Now look, many of you already know this. You actually don't just know it here, but you, you live this out. You live this teaching of Jesus out in so many ways. I have seen it time and time again. You are generous to those in need. You even forgive what others owe you. You generously give to your church so that the Word and the sacrament ministry here continues for years to come should the Lord tarry. But there are others of you who have not learned this lesson and you know it. You have not learned the way our Lord would have us steward His gifts. And you can get upset if you'd like, but I hope you don't. Again, I've lived with this text all week long. So for you who have not learned this lesson, repent. Repent of your stinginess and practice being generous with the mammon, the money, that is not even yours to begin with. Put it towards those things that will help people get into heaven and mend their broken lives. I can, to conclude, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, St. Paul encourages the church in Corinth to give money. Their hard-earned money to a problem that arose in Macedonia. There had been a famine. And St. Paul even tells the church in Corinth, I don't want you to give your money to the church in Macedonia because I'm ordering you. He says, I want you to do it out of love. I want that to be the motive. And then he tells them how. How to make them generous with their money. St. Paul says... Think about Jesus Christ. Then he quotes this verse. That though he was rich, and most likely this was a hymn that the church in Corinth was very familiar with, and when it was read at church, everybody came along with it and they started singing it as well. Though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor. The glories of heaven to the womb of a virgin, to a manger, to Bethlehem, to Egypt, back to Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? That He was rich, for your sake became poor, so that you, by His poverty, might become Ultimately, who is the steward in our lesson? It's Jesus. He's the steward. Who loses all of his wealth, loses all that he could have had to make friends for himself. Friends who were once his enemies, namely us. Going to the cross, He turns enemies into friends. And because He did so, we are on the receiving end of an ultimate relationship, living with Him forever. So, beloved, let us learn the lesson. Be generous like the shrewd steward. In the holy name of Jesus, Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord.
Amen. We rise for prayer.